Good morning. Ooh, I'm hot. There we go. Well, I, at least you all remembered to turn your clocks up. We'll see how many. <laughs> we'll see who comes driving in at the end of the service uh, to show up for church. Um, <laughs> I, I've been awake since about five o'clock wondering if my alarm was going to go off at the right time. And so uh, I, keep, I kept waking up and checking the time, and I hate that. And you, you go back to sleep. But anyhow, uh, welcome to Daylight Savings Time. And uh, we'll, we'll enjoy that time. Good to see all of you. Glad to see uh, uh, we're missing a lot of folks this morning. Between the 13 degree morning temperature and the time change, I figured we'd be down today. But. Uh, Hopefully, hopefully our, our bad weather is just about, I think tomorrow is supposed to be up in the 60s or something like that, but, so hopefully we're, we're going to see a, a big swing but, uh, and get into some spring weather. We can get rid of the, of the ice-covered uh, banners back there and, and change those out. Anyway, glad you're here. Let's just begin our service with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the time that we have to gather together in your presence in this place today. Father, our heart's desire above everything else is to just honor you in all that we say and do, to lift up your name and to offer the encouragement of the truth of your word to each person that's here. Father, we pray for the brick church this morning. Uh, we ask, Lord, that you're uh, presence would be in their service as well be with pastor randy and just bless them as we pray your blessing would rest upon us and all of the other churches of our area father may your spirit's uh, presence just be able to do the work that he desires to do in our midst father be with those of our number who can't be here this morning for whatever reason uh, some may have forgot to change their clocks some may have just decided it was too cold outside and some people may be struggling with illness or something that has kept them from being able to be here. But whatever the circumstances are, Father, we miss them and we pray that you'll be with them and watch over them and draw them close to you. Now, Father, we just commit this service into your hands and we pray that your name is glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. I will say to the people who are watching online, um, we don't know if, hopefully it's coming through at the correct speed but we, we are having some internet problems here this morning. So if it's coming through slow, if it keeps buffering, um, we just, we have, it's something we have no control over. So hopefully uh, it's working. But if not, uh, you can let the guys know by uh, putting a comment section in or putting a message in the comment section. We are going to record, we're recording the service. And we'll put it up on YouTube after the service. So if you didn't get to see it at, at the correct speed um, during the service today, you can watch it uh, probably around 1.30. It'll, it'll be up on YouTube and you can watch it at the correct speed there. But John says it looks like it's working. I just got a thumbs up from back there. So we hope that works. All right. Well, let's begin our service by taking, not taking our hymnals, but standing together and singing, leaning on the everlasting arms. Let's stand together and sing together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Before we get into this, I want you to think for a minute. Whatever it is 
that's going on in your life right now, I want you to think of that thing that is the struggle that you're struggling with right now. Your life may be going pretty good, but there's no such thing as going through life without struggles. And I want you to, on these next two verses, to think about what the songwriter might have been writing when he was talking about leaning into God, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on the strength of God, not depending on my strength alone, but leaning into God. And I want you to envision that struggle that you're having and just lean into God, almost singing the song as a prayer as we get into these next two verses and just lay that on his, on his plate, okay? Here we go. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Here's what we do, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Any birthdays? No birthdays this morning? No birthdays. All right. Junior church, you're dismissed. Junior church is dismissed to head down. All right. I want to remind you if you're watching at home to put your prayer requests in the comment section and we'll get to those in just a minute. But if you're watching at home, Feel free to add those into the comment section and we'll get those before the group as well when we get to prayer time. As far as announcements go this morning, um, right after church we're going to be having Easter play practice. And so I see, I know Elizabeth is going to try to get here. Uh, I don't see Marcus. Hopefully Marcus forgot to move his clock up and is just going to be running late. Um, that would be a typical Marcus move. Um, so we're hoping Marcus is coming. We got Vicky. Hopefully we can get everybody here because we want to, we want to run through it a couple of times and uh, we need everybody here to do that. So if anybody wants to volunteer to kind of hang around after church and read a line for somebody who couldn't be here, that would be appreciated in case somebody doesn't show up. All right. Mops is this Monday, correct, Vicky? Always it's second and fourth, right? That's what I... I I, you'd think as many times as I've asked you that question, I would know by now, but I somehow still managed to get it messed up. So that's uh, this Monday for all mothers of preschoolers, a uh, great program, great time where people that are kind of in the same boat can get together and share a time and, and uh, get to uh, uh, worship together and, or you know, just have a time of fellowship together. So uh, that's 5.30 tomorrow at the church. Go ahead. Bible study Tuesday night, continuing our study of 1 Samuel. Um, it's, just been, it's just been an interesting study. I, I've just really enjoyed it. So uh, if any time you want to join in, let me know. Uh, Truth Trackers, Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. Um, not a whole lot I need to say about that. It's open to, to all the kids uh, from pre-kindergarten up through junior high. And uh, we're open, you know, it's, it's open up to all of them, and we hope that they can come. Starts at 6 o'clock. If you need transportation to get here, let me know. Women's Fellowship will be Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. Uh, all the ladies of the church are welcomed and invited to join in on that. Go ahead. Youth Lock-In. We were going to have this last Friday and Saturday, and 
with the weather they were calling for and the uncertainty of what the weather was going to be right at the time parents were going to be picking their kids up, we decided to push it to this weekend. Plus, last weekend was the girls at States, and some of the kids were gone for that. And so um, we just pushed it to this, this coming Friday evening. Okay? Um, as far as the Easter sunrise service goes, uh, again, I don't know whether Sandy, Vicky, do, do we still, do you still have, do you have the kids you need or do we still need to, so we, we need kids, we need to know kids who want a part in the Easter sunrise service, okay? Um, if you're willing to help with the breakfast, please let us know. Did we put a sign-up sheet for helpers back there? There's a sign up, okay, there's a sign up sheet for helpers in the back, and there's a sign up sheet for things that we need donated back there. So if you're willing to donate a dozen eggs, for example, you can sign it up back there, or, you know, six dozen eggs, whatever. The price, I don't know if the price of eggs have gone through the roof like everything else or not, but there's eggs and milk and pancakes and a pancake mix and syrup and whatever else is back there, if you can help donate any of that. And if you're willing to help cook, uh, that morning, uh, please sign up so we are sure that we have enough cooks back there. We continue to just put this up for the benefit of people who may sign in online. Uh, it's not a plea for help, but if you want to know how to donate to the church, you can donate through that address or through our website. Go ahead. I put a couple of different items on this list, things you can think about that we uh, may not have had for a while. Um, Breakfast cereal, paper supplies, canned meat, peanut butter, brownie mix, jelly. Those are just things that came to my mind. Obviously, any non-perishable items are good, but these are just some items that you, can, that you can give and that you can donate. Okay? Are there any other announcements we need to make? I did get an announcement, and Kelly, you reminded me of it when you walked in. Um, Van and Esper asked me to announce, what are the dates for the... Yeah, you should. You want to show up at the right time. Okay. Anyhow, there's a play coming up that you might find interesting. Um, it was written by um, Van and Esper, who, who interviewed untold numbers of people in the community about their struggles during the pandemic of 2020 and how the community came through the pandemic. And it's just intended to be something that's just uplifting. It's a musical. It's intended to just share how the community helped one another, ways that the community helped one another during the, play, during the, the pandemic. And uh, though we're still dealing with moderate amounts of problems in the pandemic. We're not dealing with anything like we did in 2020. And so with churches closed and, and people not able to go to work and everybody walking around uh, in masks and all of that. So um, anyhow, uh, it will be coming up. And I told her that I would help announce it and would share it with uh, the other ministers in the ministerium. So just to let you know. Any other announcements? Oh, quiet today. You're like you look like you're sleepy or something. Huh? You missed an hour of sleep. You lost an hour of sleep. That's what did it. All right. Well, anyhow, um, we're glad that uh, we can do that. We want to take a moment for prayer requests. Any prayer requests that you might have this morning? Yes. Family of Jack Michael. Okay. All right. Um, Donna. Um, Thorne is having some struggles this morning. She and Elizabeth were on their way here, and she had a seizure. And so we um, need to keep Dawn in our prayers. Yes. Hilda Lambert, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked to, to Carol, too, uh, and she's her eye pressure is really high, and she's struggling with several things. I want to talk to the men's fellowship about a couple things we might need to help do for her. Uh, but yeah, Carol is, is really having some physical struggles. 
Mm -hmm. Leroy Hedrick family, yes. Tracy Landaker, okay, family, okay. I want to, I, I think I put her on the prayer list, but I want to continue to pray for Danielle. She's been having some struggles. And I want to continue to pray for Patrick. He's having some struggles, and so we want to keep them in our prayers. Any others? Any unspoken request? Let's see. I've got, uh, okay. Those two are on there, Pat, Patrick Kessner and Irene Michael and family. Okay. And again, any unspoken requests? Many, many, many. Okay. All right. We just studied prayer in my Sunday school class, and we talked about the preciousness of it. And the reason I believe that prayer is so precious is because... We're not just talking to this powerful God. We're not just talking to a God who runs the universe. We're not just talking to this all-powerful being. We're talking to our Abba Father. Abba Father in the Greek means, it could literally be translated, my dearest daddy. We're talking to somebody who cares about us individually in a way that nobody else in the world does. And so as we go to him in prayer, what a privilege. What, what a privilege to be able to come into God's presence and bring these needs to him. So let's do that together right now, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow before you, we realize that this is not just some routine act that is part of our service. This is not just something we do to look good so that we can say we've prayed for other people. We are in this moment coming before one who has loved us more and sacrificed more for us than any other person who has ever or will ever live. And Father, while... For us to be in your position would overwhelm us because just in this moment, the multitude of voices that you must hear would be overwhelming. We know that by your spirit, you are here right now in our presence. You are here to hear what is on our hearts and to meet us at the point of need we're having right now and to empower what goes on in this place in these moments and father for us to say thank you those words seem so trivial but we thank you we lift these prayer requests up to you and we rejoice in being able to do it because we know that you alone are able to meet every single one of them according to your will and your power Father, we lift them up to you and we ask that whether it be a need for healing or a need for a comforting heart or the need for guidance during times of confusion and doubt or whether it be the need for something else that we haven't even begun to think about or mention, whatever the need might be, Father, we lift these requests to you, both spoken and unspoken, and ask that you meet these individuals at their point of need and that they realize in this moment that you are there and that you are intervening and that you are making a difference in their lives. Pray, Father, that you're glorified for what happens. Father, we just thank you that we can come before you now in this moment. We thank you that we can... Just take this time and just rejoice in your presence. We thank you that we can bring these needs before you. And we pray, Father, that we might never take this lightly. Hear our prayer, Father, and touch these needs and these requests. And let your name be glorified through it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. One... Um, Thing that I should announce, many of you probably already know it because you've seen it on Facebook, but we now have Mr. and Mrs. Roth with us. Um, 
what was the date? February 14th. And you, where were you? Were you were somewhere warm. You were in Jamaica. Okay. It, well, I bet it was really hard coming back, especially this weekend. Uh, but anyhow, we're so thankful for you and for, uh, we just congratulate you in your new marriage. And uh, God bless you. I think they deserve a hand, don't you? All right. Well, let's continue by, this This is another song you probably, I know I'm doing this to you a lot, but you probably won't know this song, so you may just have to listen to it. You'll get to the point where you can sing along with it, but the title of the song is Yes and Amen, and it just talks about how sometimes what we just need to say to God is yes and amen in the way that he's dealing in our lives. So will you stand with me? And if you can't sing along with it, you can listen to it and eventually jump in where you can, okay? I'm still learning it a little bit to myself. Let's stand together. Turn it up a little more.
it's tough whenever you're standing there and you're trying to get the the rhythm of the song down that you've never heard and all of that but if you just listen to the words uh it's just a cool song it's got a cool message and uh anyway i enjoyed it i was listening to it last night and i thought i love what that's saying i want to look at a story today found in 2 Chronicles 15, talks about one of the youngest and yet one of the greatest kings of Israel. But what we're literally going to be talking about today is Lent, what Lent is about. Most Christians don't really understand what Lent is about. In fact, we're, we're entering the Lenten season and most people... When you talk to them about Lent, they say, well, that's just when you give up some food you like for uh, a few days, you know, or for whatever. You go on a fast or you, you know, and, and, and they don't even know why uh, you're supposed to do it or why some people do it. Um, it just becomes some routine, some tradition, some, something that they don't know really why they do it. It's just, it's just historically we're supposed to do something for Lent. Some people give up chocolates or sweets. Some people make it really tough and give up something like Brussels sprouts or, you know, something like that. But uh, the idea is you're supposed to pray more. You're actually, uh, some people make a, a promise. They're going to, you know, they're going to pray more. They're going to go to church every Sunday. Beyond that, a lot of people really don't have much of an idea what Lent is about. So I'm going to try to help you understand that this morning. Years ago, my dad loved gardening. Um, He couldn't wait till spring would come, load us boys up, head us out to the garden. A lot of times the garden wasn't at our house because we didn't have enough room, so we'd head to somebody else's house where he had made arrangements to use a garden plot at their house, and we'd head off and we'd go work on the garden. We'd have to clean the garden off, and we'd have to do what we needed to do to get ready for planting. And while Dad was excited about it, because he grew up gardening, they had, granddad had given each one of the boys a, what he called a truck lot. And they would, dad, dad raised corn. And uh, I don't know what Uncle Bill and, and Uncle Richard raised, but each one of them had a crop. And they would raise that crop and then they would harvest it and they would take it to the truck sale, which was just a lot that everybody brought their goods in and you would go there and you would buy directly off the back of a pickup truck. And that's how they would get their money for their, school books or their shoes or their uh, school clothes for the next year. So dad grew up gardening as something that was, was special for him. So whenever the ground thawed, he was ready to get us out and get us into the garden. Now, I have to admit, we weren't all that excited about doing it. And to this day, I still am not all that excited about gardening. How many of you love to garden? I'll pray for you. Um, you know, some people just love to garden, and, and I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. Uh, I was not one of them because Dad would make us get up uh, at like 5 o'clock in the morning, and we would have to go out before the sun got hot and get on our knees and crawl through the garden pulling weeds and all that kind of stuff, and that just wasn't my idea of fun as a kid. Dad had some warped sense of idea about how, that, how good that was, but it was not good for me. But anyhow... It was a time when, uh, in the spring, we were getting the ground ready, and everything had to be prepared, and the ground had to be tilled, and everything had to be ready. Well, Lent is sort of like that space between winter and spring. It's a time of preparation. preparation. It's a season when we're invited to prepare, if you will, the soil of our lives to receive what God wants to do in our lives, or what God is trying to do. Some people no longer acknowledge Lent. They don't know what it is, but it's one of the most ancient Christian practices. It dates back even before the celebration of Christmas. For those that are unfamiliar with it, Lent is a 40-day period before Easter that we're called to take an inventory of our lives, to commune on a more intimate level with God, to clear out those things that may distract us from our commitment to Him. It's a time of self-examination and renewal of our walk with God. To help us 
maybe better understand what that looks like, we're going to look at the story of a young man who went through his own form of Lent, if you will. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verses 1 to 19. And this was his way of preparing not only himself, but his entire nation, because you see, he was the king of Israel at the time. So now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed. And he went out to meet Asa and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. Now, Asa was the young king at the time. Okay? Azariah was the, was the prophet. Um, if you will seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without, the teaching, without a teaching priest and without the law. But when, they're, but when in, tr- in their trouble, they turned to the Lord their God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times, there was no peace to the one who went out, but to the one who came in. The great turmoil was with all the inhabitants of the land. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city, but for God troubled them with every every adversity. But you, be strong and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities where he had taken them in the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altars of the Lord that was before the vestibule of the Lord. Then he gathered all of Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelled in the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon, and they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord God was with him. So they, so they gathered together at Jerusalem. And in the third month of the 15th year of the reign of Asa, they offered to the Lord themselves, they offered to the Lord at that time 700 bulls and 7,000 sheep from the spoil they had brought. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpet of ram's horn. And all of Judah rejoiced at the oath. They had sworn with all their hearts and sought him with all their soul. And he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. Also he removed from Mecca, the mother, he removed Mecca, the mother of Asa, the king, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image and crushed it and burned it by the brook of Kidron. By the high places, but the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all his days. And he also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold utensils. And there was no war until the 55th year of the reign of Asa. What we see here is a young man deciding to bring his country back to God. The nation of Israel had gone into apostasy. Even his own grandmother, the queen mother, was worshiping another god. She was worshiping Asherah. And they were, there were all over the land, there were these idols and temples to other gods. And the people had rejected God and all sorts of turmoil had come up in the land and when Obed came to Asa and said look you need to bring them back to God he took that very seriously and he brought them back in a way that turned the whole nation of Israel around in their walk with God they began to seek the Lord the story begins with a prophet named Azariah Coming to the king with a message. Over and over, Azura's message in verses 1 to 7 was the same. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Seek him and you will find him. The message was not a casual recommendation to the king. This wasn't something that he was just saying, hey, this might be a good idea. 
This was something he said you really need to do. He's not saying just kind of wander through life and maybe you'll find God in a meaningful way. He was saying you need to seek him. In the New Testament, people who are followers of Christ are called disciples. The word disciple has the same root word as the word discipline. Discipline, a discipline is always something that's intentional. It's not ever accidental. We don't accidentally learn the discipline of algebra. We don't accidentally learn the discipline of ice skating. We don't accidentally learn any discipline, whether it be music or, or anything that you can think of that is a discipline that a person learns. We don't accidentally learn any of these things. We learn them by being intentional and being disciplined in seeking after them. There must always be intention on our part. The same is true for a disciple of Jesus. If we're going to find Jesus... There has to be an intention, a focus in our will that says, I am moving in that direction. I am going to find him. I am going to seek him. Sometimes many of us that have spent many years in church, we can sort of forget this and we can come, become sort of lackadaisical in the way that we seek God. We come to church on Sunday morning. We listen to a sermon. Okay, I've done my duty for the, for the week. I've sought God. I went to church. Done. That's not intentional enough. Lent is a time for all of us. Those that have known Christ for many years and those that are yet to encounter Him to clarify, to reaffirm, to dedicate ourselves to our intentions of seeking Him. Do we desire to seek God? That's the question. Do we desire to seek God? Maybe we're just kind of floating along hoping that God just kind of falls in our lap. The challenge is to be intentional. The challenge is to say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to seek Him. There's more. Azariah says, if you seek Him, He will be found by you. That's important. If you seek him, he will be found by you. The language here is interesting. It's better translated this way. It says, if you seek the Lord, he will let you find him. He's not hiding from us. You're not accidentally going to stumble across him. It's not going to be hard to find him. The prophet is telling us that we're seeking God that wants to be found. Every child loves to play hide and seek. When Aaron was little, we would play hide and seek sometimes. And it was never hard to find Aaron because you would cover your eyes and count and Aaron would go hide, but she always hid in a place where she could see you. And so all you had to do when you got done counting is look for a little eyeball sticking around a corner. And so I would act like, you know, I didn't see her, didn't know where she was at, and I'd look around under things and look around through things, and, and, and uh, eventually I'd rush over to the place that she's at, and she'd let out this big squeal and laugh, and she'd take off running for the safe base. To her, the fun was not in the hiding the fun was in the being found. She wanted you to find her. She didn't get the idea of hide and seek very well. But to her, the fun was in the finding. God is very much the same way. God isn't hiding from us saying, I, you know, just go ahead and try to find me. God is telling us if you seek, you will find. If you knock, the door will be opened. I'm here. I want you to find me. That's where the joy is at. The joy is in the finding. He's not intent, he, it, it's not God's intention that the Christian life be an impossible hunt for some elusive God that is hiding from us and that we have to have some enormous faith to find him. It doesn't take enormous faith to find him. He wants to be found. 
The story that illustrates that best is found in the story of the prodigal son. You all know the story. The prodigal son left home, took his inheritance, squandered his inheritance, and is deciding to come back home. And as he gets back home, as he gets near back home, he didn't have to go through some whole group of servants that said, you need to make an appointment to, to get to your father and maybe he'll see you and maybe he won't. He didn't have to go through some great formal presentation of himself to get to the father. The father was standing in the road waiting for him to come back. And as soon as he came over the hill, there was the father just waiting for him and went running to him. He wasn't hiding from him. That's the image Jesus presents to us of our Heavenly Father. The image of a God that wants to be found. James says, He'll draw near to us if we'll draw near to Him. He's the God who stands at the door, knocking, preparing to come in and eat with us if we'll just open the door. But you see, there was a Another thing that had to take place, there was a clearing and a building that took place. How do we do that? What exactly does it mean to seek God? In verse 8, after receiving the message that he had to receive, we read this. When Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Azariah, son of Obed the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Asa interpreted the command to seek the Lord in two ways. First, he understood that he had to remove the obstacles that were preventing him from finding the Lord. I want you to pay attention to that. He had, to remove the, he had to remove the articles or the things that were in his town or in his community, in his country, that were keeping people from finding the Lord. Let's think about that on a personal level. What are the things in our lives that keep us from seeking God? What are the things that get in the way? What are the things that keep us from genuinely seeking God so that we might find Him? Asa eliminated the idols from the land, the shrines, the gods, the temples that were competing with the people's devotion to God. You could say that he, that he was cleaning out the kingdom to make space for God. Way of preparing the garden to make room for growth. Now in Asa's situation, he was clearing out detestable things. But you know, not, you know, not everything that stands in the way of us seeking God are always bad things. Sometimes our kingdoms that we have around our lives need cleaning as well. Sometimes they're filled with detestable things. But sometimes it's just a matter of making space for God in our lives. To seek God means we're going to make space for Him. We prepare our lives, our, our kingdoms, if you will, for His presence to dwell with us. Lent is about walking through the hills and the valleys of our lives and clearing out the things that need to be cleared out. Identifying things that are getting in the way of us seeking God like we once did or like we should now. It's about taking inventory. That's why people during Lent abstain from certain things. Now sometimes the things that they abstain from are kind of ridiculous. But sometimes they're meaningful. I've heard of people that during Lent fast television. Something that all of us might benefit from. And they take that time that they normally would have spent watching television. That time that they normally would have spent doing some other form of entertainment. And they dedicate at least a portion of that to seeking God. That's what Lent is about. Traditionally, people have 
done this self-sacrificing and, and, and refocusing of their minds through some sort of fasting, releasing something in their lives that has a hold on them. Sometimes it's food or possessions or activities. But whatever it is, it's about preparing the soil of our lives to receive what God wants us to receive. There's a second thing Asa did. He not only removed the idols in his kingdom, but he also prepared the altar of the Lord in front of the temple. This was about a worship place. This was about preparing a time and place to worship God. Making room for that. He was putting back in place a significant means of connecting to God. How do you connect to God? Do you have a prayer place? Do you have a prayer time? Do you have a, do you have a place that you like to go to to talk to God? Do you have a routine that takes you into a personal devotion time? How do you connect to God? He was preparing that place for people to connect to God. Seeking God is not just about removing things from our kingdom that shouldn't be there, or that are standing between us and God. It's also about building things. It's about putting things in place that connect us to the one that we're seeking. There needs to be a removing. There needs to be a building. We need to subtract some things and add other things. Sometimes the vehicles that help us connect with God and experience His presence are called spiritual disciplines. They're practices that help us seek God. Things like prayer and solitude and meditating on Scripture, fasting, serving others, giving, hospitality, worship. Preparing the garden in the spring involves work, discipline that prepares us, that prepares the soil to accept the seeds and, and to be ready to bring forth life. Same is true for Lent. But he did one more thing. And I think this is becoming more and more important today. Because there are so many things that are, di that are distracting us from it. He called, for them to be, he called for them to assemble. There was an assembling. He called for people all over the land to come together and assemble together. In verses 9 to 15... We see the discipline of assembling. In verse 9, we see that all the people of Judah gathered, people from, all the, from other countries even, joined in on this. Because they heard what Asa was up to. They all gathered in Jerusalem to seek the Lord and to find out what was going on. Why is it so important that they gathered together for this? They could have made that same kind of commitment from their own homes, couldn't they? You would think. Something powerful happens when we gather. We see that we're part of something that's beyond ourselves. We're living in a time where people let everything that everything imaginal, imag imaginal, yeah, that's the right way to say the word. Imaginable. There we go. It's bad enough I can't spell now when I can't even say the word right. We're living in a time when we let all sorts of things get in the way of coming together. Any little excuse will do. And I want to tell you something. Not only is the church weaker for it, but Christians are weaker for it. I know we've come through a difficult last two and a half years with COVID. that made it almost impossible for us to gather like we once did. But the bands are being lifted. The numbers are way down. And we're going to have to learn how to live with COVID because it's always going to be here. But that doesn't mean that we need to let it stop us from coming together. I'm thankful that we've been able to incorporate the online services because there are some people that can't get out. And it's been a blessing to them. But there are also some people that are using it as an excuse. 
It's easier to sit at home on the couch with a cup of coffee in your PJs and watch church than it is to get up and get dressed and get out to church. But you know what? There's something that's encouraging to me about seeing Randy's face. It ain't much of a face, but there's something that's encouraging to me about seeing his face and seeing his smile and seeing each one of you. There's something that happens that we encourage one another just by saying that hello and offering that smile. There's something that strengthens the body and uplifts the spirit as we come together and assemble. I love Getting together. I haven't been able to do it for a while, and I'm looking forward to, in the next year, doing it. I, I love getting together with large groups of Christian pastors in, in some sort of a conference. I look forward to, to seeing uh, brothers and sisters in, over in Guatemala going to church there, even though I don't, know, don't have a clue what they're, going, what they're saying. Don't understand the sermon. But just to feel the presence. One of the best Church services I was ever in in my whole life took place in Gaumi, Africa. I mean, the teenagers, the youth sat over here. The women sat here and the men sat here. And they each took turns singing. And I'm telling you what, when them women started singing, the place got, came alive. There was joy and excitement and I, my spirit soared just being with other believers, even though I couldn't understand a word of what they were saying. Asa called for an assembly. And from all over the country, people came together. And they encouraged one another. And they blessed one another. They together made a commitment to seek the Lord. There were cycles of seeking. And I'm about done. Hang with me. I'm going to wrap it up here pretty quick. But there were cycles of seeking. In verse 15, we discover the result of the people seeking. It says, All of Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. And he was found by them. They sought him, and he was found by them. This is what Lent's about. It's about finding the Lord once again and being found by him. Asa's diligence in seeking the Lord, though part of it didn't happen until after he had assembled the group together, the church together, the, the, the country together. In fact, it appeared after they had assembled, it, appears, it appeared they were even more energized. The session served as a springboard to cleanse the kingdom even further. Verse 16 says, After removing the idols and building the altar, after assembling with the people, after finding God, then Asa deposed his grandmother from her position as queen mother. He came to see that she too was an obstacle preventing him and Judah from seeking God. He cut down her Asherah pole, which was a form of idol worship. And he also continued to rebuild the temple with gold and silver. As the group came together and they recommitted to serving God, he was able to go to the next level and the next level. As they came together, as they sought God and one thing happened in their life, all of a sudden, another thing. They, would be, they were able to move up to the next level. After they had came together, after they were seeking God, after they recommitted themselves to God, all of a sudden he turned around and looked at Grandma and said, Grandma, what you're doing is a no-no. You can't keep doing that. We're not going to have the worship of another God in, our, in this country anymore. And he tore down her temple to Asherah and deposed her as queen mother. He didn't kill her. He didn't, but he deposed her. He took her out of her position of office. I want you to see that seeking God is not some sort of a direct pursuit. It's something where we repeat over and over and over. You, re you seek God today, and you get somewhere in your walk with God, and you are lifted up, and you're encouraged, and you're helped, and that should take you to tomorrow where you seek God again, and he takes you even a little bit further. And the next day you seek him again and he takes you a little bit further again. It's not something you do once and for all time. 
If that were the case, we'd have one church service a year and everybody would be good for the whole year. Maybe we just have one church service in your lifetime and you'd be good for your whole lifetime. You sought God that one time. No. It's something that needs to continue and continue and continue. And that's how you grow. We need to remember during Lent that there's a cycle of seeking and finding God that's continuous even beyond the 40-day period. It should be an ongoing rhythm of the Christian life that is just part of who we are and what we do. In conclusion, in the spring, we prepare gardens by clearing the debris and getting everything ready, fertilize the soil, plant the seeds. But there's still work to be done the rest of the year. You don't just plant the garden and then you're done. You've got to tend the garden. You've got to hoe the garden and weed the garden. And then you've got to, later on, you've got to harvest the garden. It's a continuous process. Spring is set aside for preparation. What we do at that time will determine how the rest of the year goes. So it is with Lent. This is a season set aside for preparing our souls, clearing the debris, planting the spiritual seeds in our life of the Word of God. Like Asa, if you engage in this time of seeking, it may be a springboard for growth that goes well beyond this present time. You might find the courage down the road to tackle obstacles that maybe you're identifying right now, but you're not sure what to do with. You may discover the joy of building new altars to God that you didn't even know you were capable of in your life. You need to use this season wisely as a time of preparation for growth. Put in place good disciplines that are going to help you connect with God. Use this season of Lent to truly seek God who is longing to be found. And seek Him like you've never, fought, like you've never sought Him before. And see where He takes you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we seek all sorts of things in this world. Most of it is selfish. We seek answers to our problems. We seek material things. We seek things for our families. But Father, sometimes it's few and far between before we seek you. Oh, when everything seems to be falling apart and we don't know where to turn or what to do, then in those moments, sometimes we cry out to you and seek you out of desperation. Father, why must it be out of desperation? Help us to understand that today, right now, we need to seek you. And that you will be found, if we will. Father, bless the message to your name's glory. I pray in Jesus' name. We're going to sing our closing hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. You know, I, I sometimes struggle to give an invitation that doesn't just sound routine. Because I want you to know that in this moment, You've just heard from God's Word. And my hope is that God's Word has said something to you. I don't, I'm not looking for some sort of credit that, oh, Pastor Craig, that was a good sermon and that really spoke to my heart. That's not, this isn't about anything that I did. This is about, I hope that as you heard the story of Asa and what he did in seeking God, I hope that said something to you. And my prayer is that you won't just say, okay, I've heard another sermon. I've gone through another service. It's time to go home. I've done my duty. My hope is that in some way, you're not going to ignore God, but that you're going to respond to what God has said to you. Not what Craig has said to you, 
but what God may have said to you. You can do that by coming to an altar and talking to him about it. You can do that by bowing your head where you're at and talking to him about it. But in some way, you should respond to God. How rude would it be if in this moment I would walk up to Willard and say, Hi, Willard. That would be the way Willard would respond. How bad would it be if I would walk up to Willard and Willard would just turn his head and pull his hand back and ignore me? But don't we do that time after time after time in church services with God? When we read his word in a Sunday school class, when we hear a a godly song that touches our heart, don't we oftentimes just turn away and ignore him? In these next few moments, if God has spoken to your heart, if you want to come to the altar, you can. If you'd like me to pray with you, I will. If you want to just bow your head where you're at and talk to him. But in some way, I challenge you to respond this morning to what he may have said to you. And if if it didn't say anything to you, then maybe you need to talk to him about that too. Let's stand together as we sing, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Could I ask you to close in prayer for us?